All right. Well, good evening, everyone, or good evening for the Netherlands, that is. So uh, maybe good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're uh, calling from. And welcome to this very interesting lectures evening of ICOMOS Netherlands. Um, my name is Remco Vermeulen, and together with Thijs van Roon, which are two very Dutch names, I must say, now that I'm pronouncing them in, in, in English, uh, we organized uh, this evening and invited our, our uh, guest speakers of today. Um, the theme of today is Contested Histories Today, and we're going to talk about uh, different case studies. Well, not we are, our guest speakers are going to talk about different case, uh, case studies from uh, first of all, the United Arab Emirates, uh, then from the Netherlands, and then from South Africa. Um, if, let's see, we have some practical announcements. Um, first, we have the three speakers doing their own presentations for about 15 minutes, minutes each. Uh, uh, Kathleen Ferrier, the president of the Netherlands um, uh, Commission, Commission, Committee, Commission for UNESCO. Uh, she uh, has recorded a special video message to you all, which we will play after the first speaker. Uh, and then her colleague, Kosha Spitz, will take over. Um, you can, uh, oh, so first we have three uh, lectures, then we'll have a short break. So you guys can stretch legs or get some coffee or a drink. Um, after the break, we will come back with a short panel discussion between the three uh, speakers. So they will be able to reflect on each other's uh, presentations or ask each other questions. And after that, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, please feel free to already write your questions in the chats while one of your speakers is uh, talking. And then please also add to whom the question is, because of course, uh, if we read them back later on during this event, it may be a little bit unclear for who the question was, for whom the question was. So please do that. Um, I think that was it from practical announcement. Thijs, is there anything else practically we need to say? No, I think that covers it all. Okay. Um, if uh, the internet connection will uh, slow down a bit, we may ask you to uh, switch the camera off. That's yeah. something that we've done in the, in the past that would have worked. But uh, let's hope uh, this isn't necessary. Exactly. Exactly. Um, then I would like to give the floor to Charlotte van Emstede. Charlotte, good evening. Good evening, everybody. So let me uh, let me get your title straight. You're the president of the Netherlands Committee uh, of the Netherlands ICOMOS, right? I ICOMOS Netherlands, sorry. Yes, that's right. Okay. ICOMOS the Netherlands, yes, the that's thank right. You. The floor is yours. <laughs> that's right. Thank well, thank you so much. I'll keep it short. I am so delighted to, to see so many participants tonight um, gathering around this important topic. And I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, the distinguished speakers. Um, I want to draw uh, your attention to three points uh, with regard to tonight's theme. Um, the first is um, that every three years ICOMOS International announces a new uh, triennial program and the program running from this year through to the end of 2023 focuses on two main topics, climate change and which uh, relates to tonight's topics, emerging heritage issues such as racism, enslavement, and gender bias in the heritage field. Um, ICOMOS International chose this theme because they want to um, uh, prepare discussion papers, um, organize seminars on this topic and expert meetings um, to, to advocate in the heritage field to deal with um, these issues um, in relation to cultural heritage conservation. Uh, already various uh, initiatives have taken place. For instance, um, the workshop uh, Diversify slash Decolonize Heritage, which took place in July 2020, but also various webinars and, and, and um, symposia on themes like shared uh, cultures, uh, shared heritage and shared responsibility. 
Um, these initiatives, like these seminars and webinars and so on, are always welcomed within uh, the uh, international community and within the Europe group. But lately, um, I have noticed that um, ICOMOS is also acknowledging that we, as a, a northern, uh, northwestern European rooted NGO, that we need to hold up a mirror to ourselves as well. Um, ICOMOS itself needs to become more inclusive and um, the different uh, boards and committees which uh, make up ICOMOS uh, need a better representation of different groups and uh, voices. So that is a mission that we should all take to heart, all national committees and scientific committees. Uh, second point is going on on that, uh, the theme of self-reflection is that um, it brings me to the second point. Um, 18 April 2021, it's the International Day for Monuments and Sight. And this year, the theme is Complex Pasts, Diverse Futures. And self-reflection is seen as the starting point to bring about fair and just uh, heritage futures for all. Um, this day will show um, from various countries around the world uh, inspirational pathways to diverse futures um, from different countries. Um, when we try to uncover and um, generate more inclusive narratives in the heritage field, uh, it will surely span a wide range of conservation issues from the treatment of, for instance, um, ancestral sites, uh, and indigenous uh, remains um, in cultural landscapes to toppled monuments of uh, oppression within our built environment. Um, these, as ICOMOS Germany calls them, um, uh, uncomfortable heritage issues, brings me to the third point, and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, ICOMOS Germany, uh, led by Jörg Haspel, um, is leading an action called Dissonant Heritage. And this is taking place within the urban agenda for the EU partnership on culture and cultural heritage. Um, and they are still looking for, for a participant from the Netherlands. So if you're an ICOMOS member in the Netherlands, you would like to participate in this action this EU action led by ICOMOS Germany, please send an email to either me, uh, say van Emstede at hotmail.com, or to our secretariat, secretariat at ecomos.nl, uh, together with your uh, curriculum vitae, and then we will uh, liaise between candidates and ICOMOS Germany to see if we can get Netherlands on board of this initiative. And that's it for me for tonight. Looking all right. to all the stories. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And now, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Anissa Gultum. Uh, she is a museologist from Indonesia, but working in uh, the United Arab Emirates, UAE, as a manager for the Ras Al Khaim National Museum. Anissa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Remco. Thank you, Icomos uh, Netherlands, to invite me. And um, I hope I'm not disappointing anyone since I'm an Indonesian, but I'm not going to talk about Indonesian consistent history. <laughs> which is good. It's good. So, <laughs> which, <laughs> so um, let me share my, share my screen. Okay, hold on. One moment. Yes. So, um, we are not pirates. So this is something that I would like to share. Um, part of kind of like um, our content research development for the museum, uh, because the Sahaima National Museum is in the process of rediscovering itself, kind of um, to provide a, a fresh kind of, you know, a touch to the past, because out of seven emirates in the UAE, Rasa Haima is, the place to meet authenticity. So if you ever been to Dubai or you have been um, familiar with Dubai, people are commenting that Dubai is like Singapore, kind of like, you know, very high tech and uh, everything is so much in the future, but you cannot really feel 
the 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 culture you cannot really feel the soul but so rasa khaima is 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 uh is the place to kind of get to know what is uh who who was uh who was and who is living in in the emirates so i'm gonna start a little bit about um indonesia because my background so um in this subject the contested history is uh, in relation with the british empire so from the point of view of Indo as an indonesian we grow up by a notion i don't know where it come from that uh other countries who were colonized by the british got better future than the countries that was colonized by dutch sorry guys but that's like the kind of understanding that we go up to because we see malaysia singapore brunei you know hong kong these are other countries around us and they seem to grow faster and stuff without really paying attention that um i mean us not really paying attention that after the independence then we had a long term of uh, military regime that kind of kind of actually you know a big factor in slowing down our, our development so indonesia is a, is a really great sample of contested history because after our independence then we have the regime and then the whole indonesia concept as a nation is also kind of weird as you can see this is the the map of indonesia indonesia is the green part and you see the the the, the the orange part is Malaysia. So it's kind of weird because the West part of Indonesia speak the same language as Malaysian. They, we, we can understand Singaporeans when we, we talk to each other, um, but then we have different passports. Um, but then we have, you know, this kind of, um, the, this kind of a boundary that doesn't make sense. If you can take a look on the, on the right end of the country, in Papua New Guinea, there's a straight line over the the mountain the hills and the valleys so it's like you know it doesn't like really make any sense and they uh after the dutch left completely then we brought up i mean by our founding fathers on they set up the identity of what is an indonesian and this is something that was contested since early on by kiha jadewantara but that in an Indo indonesian is not japanese but until today, that is the that is the main campaign from the country. So the first few intangible heritage that became the Indonesia identity and UNESCO is what you can see in these pictures. There's the wayang puppet, there's the batik, and then there's the garis blade. So it's kind of you know kind of bothers me a bit because as you see Java, that um, beige um, beige area on the bottom, that's the area of the Java tribe, while the rest of the of the islands, you know, it doesn't seem like they they, they matter. And I'm originally, I mean, genetically, I came from my background is from Sumatra and Sunda, which is west of Java, but historically always like the the second option after Java. Now let's move on to where I live now. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a, a brief introduction to UAE. It's United Arab Emirates. It's a country that was united in 1972. So next year, next year, it will be their 50th anniversary and it consists of seven emirates. So if you can see the map, there's a big Abu Dhabi and then the rest is the next, the, 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 the other six emirates. So it's a little bit like a, a puzzle game because when they, when the British try to map the geography, they ask each tribe or Kabila. Kabila is kind of like a, a bigger group of a tribe who are which shake that they are um they are claiming their loyalty and the way they choose this shake is a shake that they trust more will give them um protection or um they can be their trust trusted arbitrator so whenever there is a, a fight or an argument they can kind of keep the area peaceful now this is the two days of uae so a really ambitious uh, mission in culture, getting in touch to their to their background, their identity, and um, there is a term of an emirati. But every emirate they have their own kind of uh, ways in 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 their similarities in the textile, in the coffee, in the dancing, and everything. So they have the uniqueness. Although the world hasn't really seen much, 
but I'm sure they will see much, much more from, from this region. The Gulf and the Khalidi. So why did I put the Gulf? Because if you access Google Map from this region, you will see it's the Arabian Gulf. But when you access Google Map from other part of the world, you will see Persian Gulf. So it was, it was a long history of political history between the Iranian and the Arab side of the Gulf, because um, there was a time in the 50s, the, the Iranian used the, the, the name Persian Gulf as in like, it's their Gulf. So uh, there is no take from the Arab community. But historically, yes, from the Greek time, it was always called the Persian Gulf. But since the 50s, from this side, if you want to refer to the Gulf, it's the Arabian Gulf. Khaliji is the Arabic name of the people who lives in the Gulf. So that consists of people who live on the Arabian side, here on the left, and also who live on the right side, which is the Persian, um, Persian side. So you see here, there's, um, this is actually the old name of the ports in this Gulf. And this um, port up, up to the end to Basra, this is all connected to Europe. This is all connected to China, of course, India, Africa, because there are records of even goods from Batavia reach to this region. Um, uh, seventh century ceramics from Tang Dynasty found so much, in uh, too, too much in Rastakhaima. They will, here they use the word too much instead of very much, they will use too much. Uh, in, in a way, in a very positive way. So this area here, when the Gulf, it looks like the gate of the Gulf, that is where the, um, the certain Khaliji uh, tribe that I would like to uh, focus on this talk is the Kasimi. So the Kasimi is now the, 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 the ruler for the Rasahaima Emirate and also Sarja Emirate. Um, um, but at the time, uh, back then, they are the they were the strongest tribe that controlled this area, and even the other tribes in the region also uh, follow uh, follow what they 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 asked them to do. In one seven seventy two, there was um, there was a, a problem between the Ottoman authorities with some certain pirate real pirate who took their boat but then no one knows who are these pirates and then they accused the the kasimi uh, tribe and then the, um, the kasimi tribe the sheikh went to to basra uh, at the end of the gulf to meet the ottoman uh, authority and they say look you are taking our boat because you think we took your boat listen give us our boat and we'll give you back your boat so the, the power that they had uh, back then is, um, I mean, the respect that they got from all the tribes in the Gulf is so powerful that they can get the boat from this certain type that they didn't even know before. So they announced it and then the tribe will okay, we were the one who did it. We want to come back to the peace situation and we will return um, the boat. So, this is the, pic, the one of the earliest pictures of the Khaliji uh, uh, people, uh, especially in Rasahaima. In uh, this was taken by Tessiger. Uh, he was uh, he was one of the earliest explorers to to the region. As you can see, people here are living in a very like uh, you know frugal kind of situation, especially after. Uh, I mean. I mean not all of them can do can do trading but these are literally in in the shore see this building in the back with the children this is literally the the museum back then so they're just fisheries they they do fishery they they they're ichthyas. okay i can't even say that I, I wrote it in my in in my abstract but i can't even say it they even called since the greek are the people who eat fish so this is what they're they're known but then um, other than that, of course, you know the Bedou, the people who roam around, who roam around the, the desert, and they can survive through the desert and bare feet with their camels. And it's amazing; these are amazing people. They can survive in the desert. They can survive in the sea. So, at the time, in 1622, 
it was the first time the English and the Dutch um, had a station in the, the Gulf. Then they, of course, rivalry and everything. And in 1778, the Persian uh, Empire started to decline. Now, this is opening a room for either the British, either the Dutch and the Omani to kind of like, you know, struggle. They want to dominate the era. And also the Kawatim, supported by the Wahhabi from Saudi. So this kind of created a need for the British to create fake news. So let's come back. Let's uh, step back a little bit and see the evolution of the people's empire. So this is how their business model, okay? They go to a land, take it, and then use it. Okay, it's, you know, uh, do whatever they can to ex exploit the uh, economic value, sort of. Uh, there were only like three, five years in Indonesia. Uh, and oddly, it was seen as one of the, um, the great years of, uh, of, of study in, 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 in ancient part of Java. So, but the British, as you know, is, is it, 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 it's, it's a, the business model is, is just a crime. I mean, I'm going to show you a bit that kind of introduced me to what is colonialism. I'm just going to play it. And we built up empires. We stole countries. That's, if that's how you build an empire. We stole countries with the cunning use of flags. Yeah. <laughs> Just sail around the world and stick a flag in. I claim India for Britain. Mega, you can't claim us. We live it. Five hundred million of us. Do you have a flag? We don't need a bloody flag. We lose our country, you bastard. No flag, no country. You can't have that. That's right. Crazy just made up. I'm sorry. Up with this gun that was lent from the... Right. So um, uh, the British uh, try to, 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 I mean, take over the world, you know, with this kind of, with this kind of method. And when it, it, it doesn't kind of work, um, they spread news. Uh, this area, it is what uh, they call as the pirate, pirate coast in the map. They put it on the map. They put it as the pirate port. They put it as the pirate coast. And this is this is where Drasa Khaima and, and, and Saja is lo, uh, are located. So as you can see, um, and across Rasa Khaima, also uh, part of the Kasimi uh, tribe, and they also uh, regard this on the on the map as the as the as the pirate. And this is you know becoming an official document. And and following that. For 10 years, they did campaign and they did like uh, treaties, but it didn't really work. At the end, they 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 attacked uh, Rasa Khaima in 19, uh, 1908 and also 19, uh, eight, eight, sorry, 1809. Oh, oh, sorry, my brain doesn't work. 1809 and 1819. As you can see on the left, that's the plan of the attack. It's a small area. It's a small area. And then, um, uh, this area uh, that, that I show you, the, the previous picture, this was the fort that they say is the pirate fort. And this is the other kind of fort at, at the, uh, in, the, in the hill, in the interior. And they just go on and then really just destroy the area and then the boats and kind of really destroy um, the, the power. They really, really want to uh, cripple the Kawasim. And the thing is, the first, it was the east the EIC who started, but then with this hoax and then kind of creating the stories like the Minerva ship, they're creating the story. The, the wife of the captain was captured and sold as a slave and, and while, you know, being parade to the city. And it, it was not, it didn't happen, but they used this as, as part of, uh, as a campaign toward the British government actually sent the Navy to support the EIC to destroy Rasa Khaima. And um, this then lead to the General Treaty of P Peace in 1820. That was, that was uh, written, I mean, that was signed in this palace, in Palaya Palace of Rasa Khaima, that became the historical foundation of the United uh, Arab Emirates. So um, 
they make all of these emirs from different emirates to come and sign. Now, what I would like to kind of focus on how the Qasimi intellectual and the British intellectual kind of give a response uh, through a really detailed and thorough um, selection, I mean, sorry, um, analysis of documentation of the letters, how the Qasimis actually really trying diplomacy, trying to deny that they failed to honor the British flag. And then also um, um, Charles E. Davis um, identifying piracy, according to English law, is hotis humani generis, the enemy of humankind. So what they did, they campaigned that the Qasimi is the enemy of the international trade in this region. That's why everyone have to be against them. Another thing that kind of really admiring for me. So the, the Sheikh of Sarja, um, Sultan bin Muhammad Al-Qasimi, PhD in history, actively made publication articles and this one book that kind of really went through all of the facts and saying, we are not tired. We were responsible traders who were respected by the other tribes in the region. So it gets you to, to ask, so who's the pirate? This guy was um, uh, a guy from the Shameli tribe who lives in Rasa Khayma. So Shameli also near the coast. One day I went to an old heritage village um, near the coast, but it's in the valley. Uh, we couldn't find a way to get there. So we parked in front of his house. He saw us and then he said, where you come from? We are from the museum. Uh, we're trying to get to this to get to this village. You're taking the wrong road. Wait for wait for me here. I will take my four by four, like the car. He bring us. That's him with his son because his son can speak English and he doesn't really speak. It was me and one uh, one other lady from the co the collection unit. He brought us to uh, to this hidden village of their ancestors from rocks and oh, this is it, it's an amazing site that inshallah we will launch this year and they, they he speak about the 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 pride of heritage and and their identity and this is like this is a guy who i don't know before i meet on, on the side of the road and there's another shake like there he's really composing a really admirable like scientific historical data to say hey we are not what you're claiming us our ancestor is not like the, like that and they have this and very interestingly they have the same saying that we found in makassar the sea belongs to god and the land belongs to you so it's it's a really really amazing way for them to kind of saying you know what? Maybe you are the one who's the enemy of mankind. Anissa? Thank you. Yeah. Was this your last slide? No. Yes. Yeah, you just slide. finished. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting insights into UAE history, which I didn't know, at least. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, you may stop sharing your screen now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will right away proceed. And, and again, a reminder for everyone, if you have questions for Anissa or for any of the other upcoming speakers, please uh, put your questions in the chat so we can address them after the break. And then I would like to now proceed with the video message from Kathleen Ferrier, the um, president of the Netherlands Commission uh, for UNESCO. And after that, uh, her colleague, Koosje Spitz, who is a senior advisor at the Netherlands Commission for UNESCO, will uh, continue um, their joint um, uh, presentation. All right, let me share my screen. And I'm assuming everyone can see this. Thank you for nodding, Charlotte. I can still see you. <laughs> Dear friends, good evening. First of all, I want to thank the Dutch committee, ICOMOS, for organizing this important evening on the lecture on contested histories. My name is Kathleen Verley. I'm the chair of the Dutch UNESCO Commission. 
Unfortunately, I will not be able to be with you all night, but I'm delighted that Mrs. Koshi Spitz from our bureau will bring forward the vision of the Dutch UNESCO Commission on this hugely important and urgent topic. Whenever we talk about the importance of cultural heritage, I refer to the words that were said in 78 by the then Director General of UNESCO, Mr. Amadou Matar Mbo, who said that objects of cultural heritage represent the soul of a nation, the soul of a people, and therefore need to be treated with respect. We as National UNESCO Commission in the Netherlands find it hugely important that all the items in our societies, in our cities, but wherever in our country, the items that represent our cultural heritage are places where people can discuss our national heritage, our common history, our shared past in all the aspects that go with it. We are all aware today, and we will hear it in the words of all the speakers from the United Arabs, from, the, um, from South Africa, how urgent this discussion is. And here in the Netherlands, we we starting to deal more and more with this discussion. And what we as National Committee for UNESCO find important is that we create the places where all perspectives can be shared and all visions can be heard with respect and with acceptance. What we have seen in our societies, for instance, when it comes to our common history regarding slave trade and everything, uh, the dehumanization that comes with it, is that certain stories were not heard. What we find important is that all the perspective all the perspectives can be shared in a safe place, in a safe uh, atmosphere. Um, we have had discussions in the Netherlands on the statues. And as National Committee, we see statues in the first place as creating possibilities to have the important dialogues we should have. And if this dialogue results in a consensus consensus that the statue should be removed, then it can be removed. But removing a statue from public space without the necessary discussion in which all perspectives can be heard and discussed and questioned, that is something that we um, do not agree upon. So um, I do hope that uh, the discussion this evening that will give us the, the perspectives from so many different places in the world will help us all together to see the importance of the cultural heritage that binds us together, not only as, as a nation, but as human beings, to make the mission of UNESCO um, more realistic. And that mission is creating peace in the minds of women and men. That is where it all starts, in our minds. And, the, and we as a UNESCO Commission say, that is where it starts, in the mind. And in the mind, and therefore, it is so important that we create the spaces for frank and open dialogue. I wish you a very fruitful evening and I look forward to the outcomes of your discussions. Thank you very much. All right, I, that was some beautiful introduction uh, words by uh, Kathleen Ferrier uh, Koosje. Uh, <laughs> hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm understanding you're gonna continue this, uh, this introduction by Kathleen Ferrier. Yes, that is uh, indeed correct. Well, thank you, first of all, Remco and also Thijs for organizing this event um, uh, on behalf of uh, Ecomus Netherlands. 
Um, I have to uh, uh, apologize uh, on behalf of uh, Kathleen. Uh, she's unable to attend because she has other obligations at the moment. Um, uh, but she's very looking forward, or she's looking forward to receiving uh, comments, questions, and better, further points of uh, discussion uh, in which she hopefully, hopefully can participate in the future. Um, I will share my presentation now, which we have jointly uh, created. So uh, also, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay, so um, uh, today um, I will uh, be giving a little bit of an insight into the uh, stance of the Netherlands Commission for UNESCO. Um, and uh, in that light, um, I, I will not be talking that much about the Netherlands as a case study, but more of uh, what we uh, as a National Commission propose uh, within the framework of the UNESCO discussion worldwide. So I wanted to bring this discussion a little bit back to myself um, or to, to my personal situation. Um, because uh, 10 years ago, I, I was actually working um, for the Dutch embassy in Australia and I was part of the Dutch shared cultural heritage program. And I visited the city of Hobart um, in Tasmania and I was welcomed by the honorary consul of the Netherlands um, um, on Tasmania. Um, or for Tasmania, and he took me to a monument um, which was in honor of Abel Tasman. And that monument, which was a fountain um, portraying the work, or at least the landing of Abel Tasman, um, and a statue of himself. Um, and this honorary consul was talking to me, uh, being extremely proud of this monument, uh, and um, telling me that it was opened by the Queen, Queen Beatrix in 1988, and that it was uh, created by the Dutch community. Um, and while he was talking very proudly about this monument, there was a father um, standing close to us, an Australian uh, man with a daughter of around eight to 10 years. And on the one hand, I was hearing these really positive stories about the history of Abel Tasman and the Dutch influence. And at the same time, I was hearing what this father was telling his, uh, his daughter. Um, because on the plaque uh, at the site, there was a reference uh, to uh, Abel Tasman, but in the context of him um, discovering um, uh, Tasmania, um, and um, there were words used also in this plaque, um, uh, like discovery, um, and also uh, stating the European presence um, or introduction uh, to Australia. And this father was actually telling his daughter at that time um, his, uh, what a disgrace this monument was, um, how uh, this monument was ig ignoring or ignoring the, um, uh, the, the, the fact that there had been for thousands of years already indigenous peoples living um, on the island, that uh, the uh, as European settlement that followed in the centuries after uh, the landing of Abel Tasman, um, what it inflicted on uh, the indigenous communities. Um, and for me, that was a striking example of contested histories, a someone who was still clearly as an honorary consul so attached to this pride or this part of this Dutch history that he wanted to be highlighted. And on the other hand, a new generation of people, of Australians reflecting on their own um, history and also being uh, partly sh ashamed by what had happened in the past. And I think that is something that we see as an example, how these kind of monuments, although perhaps uh, uh, then created or, or shown uh, for a positive reason can actually become a place of reflection and dialogue um, at a later stage. So, uh, as said, um, the Netherlands Commission has uh, stated that they call upon uh, um, uh, uh, the people that were part of the protests in, in light of the Black Lives Matter um, not to take down or damage statues, uh, but to actually start a dialogue. Um, and uh, that has been a statement which has also um, uh, received some backlash uh, for people saying you don't sympathize with the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, and I think that this uh, presentation hopefully also shows a little bit why the UNESCO Commission has made this statement. 
So if we look at UNESCO as a UN body, it was created shortly after the Second World War with all the devastations and the horrors of the Holocaust in mind. Um, and um, also in the years after, you must imagine that almost two thirds of the world at that time was still under colonial ruling. Uh, um, so uh, at least a lot of people were in, uh, living in territories with the colonial rule. And that has changed a lot because in the 1970s, um, that actually uh, uh, completely flipped and you see that there were a lot of countries that went independent, but that's also a development that you've seen within UNESCO. So one of the strongest things that I've seen so far is also in the constitution of UNESCO that states, and I like that phrase, um, that ignorance of each other's ways and, um, sorry, lives, my apologies, um, have been a common cause throughout the history of mankind of that suspicion and mistrust between the peoples of the world through which their differences have often uh, all too often broken into war. And I think that's also something that UNESCO is trying to um, uh, erase is the ignorance that we have towards each other's lives and cultures, and also to show that we are all part of a common and collective, um, and that we should work towards uh, the same goal. So in the 1970s, we saw some important steps that were uh, or, uh, milestones. One was the uh, uh, adoption by UNESCO of the Declaration on Race and Racial Prejudice, making UNESCO one of the first UN bodies to be so extremely outspoken against racism. Um, as said by Kathleen, also the plea by DG Mbao for the return of irreplaceable cultural heritage to those who created it. Um, it's, I think, a very interesting uh, plea if you read it now also in the context of the um, return and restitution discussions that we have um, at the moment also in the Netherlands. And the last one was the inscription of the island of Gore uh, onto the World Heritage List. And I specifically mentioned here also the justification for it because they said we want it to serve as a reminder of human exploitation and as a sanctuary uh, for reconciliation. I'm not sure if we actually got there. Um, I think that's a discussion that should be uh, held also within UNESCO to see if these kind of places that we put on such a list uh, actually uh, end up being these kind of places for places for reconciliation. Um, so what you see is that placing something on a list doesn't automatically also mean that you then also have more understanding. Um, so that's why that in 1994, there was also the Slave Root Project and that was initiated initially by, uh, uh, by Haiti uh, and uh, taken up by UNESCO. And the aim was actually to contribute to a better understanding of the causes and consequences of slavery. So to create context and understanding and knowledge exchange about the impact that slavery had, has worldwide. To highlight the global transformations and cultural interactions that resulted from this history and to contribute to a culture of peace by promoting reflection on inclusion, pluralism, intercultural life dialogue. Um, so actually to pri provide much more depth to the discussion about the impact of slavery on our culture, on our, um, on our cultural heritage and how we can use this cultural heritage also for this dialogue. So um, an interesting example of how you could do that is um, uh, for example, the work of um, Max Miller, who is a jazz, a jazz musician, but he's also a spokesperson uh, for the um, UNESCO Slavery Root Project. And um, what was interesting that in 2012, he uh, made a song which was uh, named Gore after he visited uh, the island. And um, he was struck by the impact of not only what he had seen, but also he tried to compass or include this into a song. Um, and UNESCO saw that and said, look, can you use music in order to provide further discussion and dialogue on our slavery history? And um, so it ended up um, in an album and he toured around uh, the world, also ended up in the Netherlands through the North Sea Jazz Festival. And he actually visited the slavery monument in Rotterdam and said, look, we should break the silence trying to use music, but also trying to show how you can use places and, and cultural heritage um, that is a, a remnant of such a horrible past, but at the same time is also creating a new kind of uh, a starting point for uh, looking at our past. And I think it's a beautiful way to see how contemporary culture can actually also 
combine together with cultural heritage to have this dialogue. And at the same time, we also see that UNESCO is failing on certain points uh, when it comes to how to deal with contested heritage um, and contested histories. So the example, for example, is the uh, Memory of the World uh, program. Um, I'm showing you now a print screen um, of the um, of a newspaper, Jap Japanese newspaper. Um, one of the issues that has been raised there was four years ago, there was a nomination put forward about the comfort women. Um, uh, and um, that had led to such a, um, a protest by uh, uh, Japan saying look, that the UNESCO should not be a platform to be put forward such nominations to have these kind of certain viewpoints on history. And so the outcome was that UNESCO needed to have a dialogue on how to deal with these kind of differences in viewpoints with regard to historic events. Um, what happened is actually that it paralyzed the whole program and it, there have not been any new nominations whatsoever since four years already now. And it doesn't seem that there is going to be an outcome in, uh, uh, shortly. So you see that actually, uh, with all good intentions, still UNESCO is failing on certain points to have discussions and dialogue on these contested histories. Um, we also see this discussion coming back at the World Heritage Convention. Um, so, for example, there's a discussion on whether nominations and, and uh, inscriptions with a link to recent conflicts should belong uh, onto the World Heritage List. ICOMOS has published a paper uh, quite recently on this, saying the message of peace and reconciliation associated with inscriptions on the World Heritage List have not been heeded. So Auschwitz Beer Canal, but also the Peace Memorial in um, Hir uh, Hiroshima did not end up actually being this um, example of reconciliation uh, in at least, or uh, also be linked um, and then highlighted the idea of this peace discussion uh, properly enough. Um, it also say, said that sites associated re with recent conflicts cannot be accompanied, accompanied by the concepts of World Heritage Convention. I will not go into that, but it's an interesting dis uh, discussion whether something like recent conflicts and sites associated to these memories uh, belong uh, on a list as the World Heritage List, um, because they should somehow uh, add to this positive message of outstanding universal value. Um, so that's an interesting discussion and I'm going to wrap up now, but um, the question is, if we want to reflect, we need to define new approaches for teaching. So how can we actually deal with contested histories? And we see that within UNESCO, we, we're still trying to find ways to do that in a, a, a multilateral uh, setting. Um, and also we should be able to identify much better on what types of heritage are there and which voices are heard, which narratives are told, and also which sites end up on international and national lists. So the NAS Commission has put um, forward a advice or a report in 2017 um, with regard to the Netherlands and uh, advising policymakers how you could actually start a dialogue. And one of the points that had been raised is that the Dutch society is polyphonic. That means is that we have multiple voices. Um, we have a continuous growing variety of perspectives. Um, but at the same time, we still have a very dominant majority that has a very traditional view with regard to our own history. And that is difficult sometimes to see which narratives fit there. And also our heritage policies are often based on these very traditional narratives. There's also a difference between our our rural areas and, for example, the Randstad or the larger cities. So the, the outcome was there are three strategies when it comes to contested um, heritage. You can either remove, destruct a certain object or a, a site. You can adapt it, modify it, add narratives, add information, um, or you can preserve it as it is, but then you actually exclude uh, groups uh, in uh, voicing their um, viewpoint towards this history. Um, so that's very quickly. I would recommend you to read uh, this document um, and I'm happy to elaborate on it at a later point. Right. Well, thank you very much, Kosha, for that and for showing the, uh, the way UNESCO as an organization in internationally <laughs> operating, of course, is, um, yeah, tackling or trying to tackle this uh, very uh, interesting yet difficult to topic of contested uh, heritage and history. 
Um, then, now, last but not least, let's uh, continue with our last speaker of today, uh, Zahira Asmal. Zahira is the founder and director of The City, and she is a, a well-known urbanist. Uh, Zahira, the floor is yours, and I will share my screen now. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much, and good evening to everybody. Um, I am, for some time now, interested in history public memory and cultural iconography in relation to making inclusive spaces and representational equity in post-colonial cities. And I focus mainly on Cape Town and Johannesburg. However, we also link to the cities that have a past or places that have a past and present connection with uh, our cities here in South Africa. Um, so while I was conducting research for Movement Cape Town, an anthology I edited exploring the economic, political, social, spatial, and cultural movements that have created Cape Town and continued to shape the city, I noted responses from black and brown residents who expressed that they frequently feel ignored or unacknowledged in Cape Town. And in instances where they don't feel um, invisible, they attested to feeling hyper-visible or exoticized singled out on the basis of difference. Considering that black and brown people constitute approximately 85% of Cape Town's population, it is alarming that so many attest to feeling invisible or unrepresented as evidenced by the numerous protests that happen across the city. That such oppression is routinely shrugged off or deemed normal signals an urgent need to explore the generative potential in the democratic and hybrid aspects of contemporary life in Cape Town. Most people working formerly in heritage in South Africa are white and older, uh, and discussions often center around preservation. Preservation of buildings, spaces, monuments, uh, statues, all under the banner of heritage. But then I wonder whose heritage is this? What have we inherited? In South Africa, black people have inherited very different things than white people have. Um, Black people have inherited uh, dislocation, abandonment, um, and living on the edges of society, South society and marginalization, whereas white people have inherited land and opportunities more generally. So very different. Um, and then so I wonder about the histories, memories, and stories, identities that have been decimated through colonialism, slavery, and apartheid, as is so apparent in South African cities and many other places in the world. So now I, I also often um, conduct history, uh, conduct research in the Netherlands and often find the conversation is always around preservation. Um, and I would like to, in spaces like this, um, like to hear more about, um, yeah, about what about the histories that have been decimate, decimated? How do you create those stories in the public life of the city? Uh, in the imagery that I will be sharing, taken in J Cape Town and Johannesburg, I wish to share the discuss and discuss the histories, memories, and identities that have been decimated in the case of District 6, the ones that need to be acknowledged, such as Prestige Place, and the ones that need to be rescripted in order to turn an inclusive spaces into, inc sorry, excuse me, uh, turn exclusive spaces into inclusive spaces, as the case of Park Station in Johannesburg. Uh, so could we get to the Slide, please. Um, the third slide. Please, Remco. Yes, right here. Between 2003 and 2006, various construction projects in Greenpoint, Cape Town, unearthed human remains. It turned out to be a profound transformational moment. These were the remains of over 3,000 mainly enslaved people from the colonial period left in unmarked graves, silent for centuries. Suddenly, they argued the historical record contradicted the colonial archive and encouraged us all to embrace a broader understanding of Cape Town. For, the, for academic Christian Ernston, who says, the resurfacing of the dead challenges the trope of national unity and alerts us to the failure of urban transformation. Yet these instances also allow for new ways of following the Cape ancestors and new ways of transforming the colonial archive. In truth, much of our history remains hidden, buried, unseen. It is our task to find that we, what we can, searching beyond textbooks and biased political propaganda. What can the remains and ruins of our ancestors reveal? And how can oral histories, uh, what can oral histories tell us? Next slide, please. 
you will see in this image um, from Prestige Memorial, um, the, the human remains that I was referring to are stored in an ossuary uh, right next to a coffee shop. And this is the image I had taken. And so this ossuary houses 4,000, um, yeah, the human remains of 4,000 people. And so this is very telling about the city of Cape Town's priorities of honoring the past. It's used, uh, you can see it's used as a storage space. There's chairs there and um, people's bodies are in uh, cardboard boxes. Next slide, please. District six. In 1966, the multicultural neighborhood District six on the slopes of Table Mountain was declared a white area as part of the Group Areas Act, which meant that all prime real estate close to the city affording greater access to opportunity and visibility was allocated only to white people. 60,000 people forming a diverse and multicultural society were forcibly removed from their homes and dumped 30 to 40 kilometers on the outskirts of the city, dislodged and isolated. This has a major impact on the spatial development and the identity and culture of the city. Um, Remco, you can go to the next slide. To this day, the people of District 6 have not been repatriated. This has devastated, ha this has devastated in economic impacts on this group of people. It is also due to horrific violations to human rights that Cape Town remains a culturally white city, while the majority of people remain a cultural minority in their own city. Next slide, please, Remco. Park Station. The design of the Park Station building in 1932 was focused on conjoining British and Afrikaner identities at the dawn of what was the Union of South Africa. It was a political project initiated after the two South African wars and the discovery of gold on the reef and diamonds in Kimberley. Park Station is thus a building that is rich with meaning, heritage, identity formation and design. These multiple layers allow for different interpretations by the diverse travelers who walk through it. Just like railway tracks, the original 1932 Park Station as seen in this image um, was an image of parallel and entirely separate spaces. It was designed by white people for white people to be glamorous, gener generous and exclusive. As such, today's Park Station is a site of nostalgia for white South Africans, even for those too young to have experienced it when it was in operation. For black South Africans, however, the same building is a symbol of servitude and humiliation. Several design elements of the Park Station building were intended to evoke a white South African identity. The frieze um, facing um, Ilof Street depicts the Great Trek, the journey of Afri Africana people in the Cape moving uh, north to establish the independent states of Orania Freistaat and the Zaid Afrikaanse Republic. The frieze captures the hardships of the pioneering migration, but ignores the displacement, enslavement and murder of South Africa's indigenous black inhabitants. Inside the building, uh, Remco, we can go to the next slide, please. The blue interior tiles celebrate the Afrikaners' roots in Dutch culture. The doors are also designed with Cape Dutch style in mind, at the time enjoying a revival in local architecture as a uniquely South African signature. Then there were the 32 murals of South African landscapes painted by Pionief. These details thus combined in an opulent building that celebrated white South Africans while black South Africans were relegated to pokey back doors and rooms. Even the concourse for black people were visibly inferior, offering no shelter from the elements. For white South Africans then, the train station took on meanings of exoticness, luxury, and a rite of passage from scenic rural landscapes to the utilitarian cityscape of Johannesburg. Indeed, as railways proliferated in the 19th century, they came to represent industrialization and a march of modernity, necessitating an architecture that captivated this point of arrival in time and place. But for black South Africans, the train and its station were a nexus in the larger project of apartheid and became everyday sites of oppression. The train journey represented their dislocation, their isolation and their persecution. The arrival of black people at Park Station was tolerated rather than welcomed. This is evident in the design of the current station. Next slide, please. The station leaves no positive memories, no physical or mental souvenirs for people uh, arriving and departing Johannesburg. 
It is devoid, sanitized, and over-commercialized with the cheap and tacky branding of big enterprises. The collective memory of the old station has largely been lost. Those familiar with the mothballed concourse are no longer with us. These days, few even know it exists. But I believe it can be incredible. It can be an incredible place, activated by thoughtful programming, behaving like a truly public space that's about people coming together and feeling comfortable together. In South Africa, we're so used to public spaces being contested that we cannot just be in them. So my vision for Park Station is to shift its exclusivity to inclusivity, to create a democratic arena that embraces the everyday con connections of the station to the African con continent and diaspora, to mark a grand arrival and welcome to all those visiting and moving to Johannesburg, a safe, warm, cultural rich passage through the city. Uh, Remco, do I have more time? Yes, you do. You have uh, a few minutes left. Okay, then I'll just wrap up. Um, so we all know that people welcome each other over food, music, and art, expressions of themselves that they wish to share with others. So I proposed a place for trading and learning and symbolism and performance, a place to gather, to pause from constant movement, and with one million, one million, excuse me, one million people moving through the park station precinct each day, it is a perfect place to make bold statements and I suggest rescripting the old station from a colonial place of exclusive travel and much contestation to a meaningful meeting place for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sahira. And I'll show myself again, sorry. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sahira. That was actually a very beautiful uh, description and uh, about a very common site, I would say. Um, a train station. Um, I think for now we earned a break. Uh, so I'll give you, uh, let's have a 10 minute break. So we reconvene at, well, my time 2048. Um, see you then. And uh, we will then continue with, first of all, a panel discussion between the three uh, speakers. And then we will, I will open up the floor for questions from the audience, which I've already seen coming in in the chat. Thank you very much for that. All right, see you in 10 minutes. The meeting is being recorded, which means we can continue after our break. I hope you will, uh, you're all back by this time. I only see a few screens that popped up. Okay, there's two speakers still. That's good. <laughs> ah, okay, we're complete. Great. All right. Um, Dear speakers, uh, did you already come up with any questions that you have for each other? Or maybe maybe reflect, maybe Anissa, would you like to start with a short reflection on the two uh, presentations that both Kosha uh, and uh, Zahira gave? Well, <clears throat> um, what interests me from Zahira's presentation is about, you know, like you said, uh, the common spaces that seems regular, but it has a really, <clears throat> you know, dark background story. I think um, in terms of station, you know, rail station with India and in Indonesia, that's like, <clears throat> I think in comparison to the, let's say the Jakarta <laughs> City Hall, it, it's, in terms of you know the, the size it's 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 gigantic it's it's literally mm -hmm. going through the geographical space of the region and kind of like uh, really torn you know how people live like they just they they make the railways without you know thinking mm -hmm. of what was there and they just wanted to do it because of the um <clears throat> The commercial interest and um if you haven't seen this there was a i can't remember this guy he's um uh, from from india and he was talking about when there was a saying that the indian has to should be thankful because the british uh, brought their modernity <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, the, the ways and stuff I mean, it's it's kind of like a common thing that we see, like this this, you know, maybe some people call it industrial heritage, but mm. I think that's kind of 
kind of make it vague on how whose industry <laughs> yeah <laughs> because yeah. The, the yeah the latest us uh, indonesian heritage site that was inscribed in unesco is the oh my god the name went out of my head it's it's a mining in sumatra uh it's one of the first i think it was by uh, it was also by the Avalunto. dutch colonial yes thank you john paul yes i got the tour but i didn't get the rest of it <laughs> and um uh so it really boggles my mind why would my why would indonesia focus on this one and they said because it was it, it is the symbol of the innovation of technology at the time okay but at the time our people where they where, where are they <laughs> <laughs> they're not on the railway <laughs> maybe they're under the railway <laughs> so um i think um there was one of the comments about how uncontested history we we cannot just talk about positive things we just have to be really honest so i would be interested to 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 know what zahira thinks on how how to deal with this we're still using the train it still works for us we it's for our life with but but how to deal with, with the past is we just you know how how can we move on more like how we can move on and um so we do start with one, that one question on this or oh, for Koshi okay <laughs> <laughs> okay i thought it would be like you know no no you can continue with the question for Koshi that's okay <laughs> <laughs> um it's it's really interesting for me to know about this um um It was there was about the, a commission that that works to kind of um, amplify the the UNESCO site. Sorry, I couldn't I couldn't found the the Netherlands Commission. Uh, and main aim to increase the visibility of UNESCO within the Netherlands and to advise. So, I would be interested. What is to advise on this? Is it more in the contested history or how to present the contested history or how to develop? And you know it's kind of related with let's say if the site is kind of like Sawalunto or this um, station, like how how would how would this kind of condition be associated? Thank you. All right, first Sahira. Yeah. So um, I, I also there, there's a person Dan on the chat who asked a question um, about so I, and he said I don't know if I'm getting you right, but you. You, I think Dan and you are asking a similar question of how do we deal that in this space? Do you want to speak specifically on the train station or just generally in contested spaces uh, with the references that I made? I, I mean, in, in any any way that you think would be. Oh, I want to reflect on something you just said, and I'm just going to add before I get to how we deal with things. But I want to talk about when you talk about industry. I I'm totally with you on that. I think the kind of colonial justification is always two things well multiple things but there are two that come up in most primary ways with the most average you know uh, layman who's not working in any of the fields that we're talking about one of them is civilization we brought civilization to the places uh, that we went to south africa indonesia india elsewhere and so that is mistaken what you just what, what is understood by civilization If there are people, if there are two people anywhere, there's a civilization. You don't need industry to have a civilization. Uh, number two, industry. You know, you, so no, you, you, you know what I mean. We we often hear the same things, you and I. Um, and then also with industry linking to civilization, people talk about. Uh, well, it's actually talking about capitalism and the advancement of globalization, right? But with, they're not talking about. But these are the same people that are environmentalists sometimes. So, for instance, in the Cape, you won't like people don't come to the Cape to see wildlife. I mean, you get wildlife, but they're not going to be seeing the so-called Big Five, which is a co colonial game hunting term. Like you're not going to see lions and rhinos and elephants roaming around Cape Town, largely because the Dutch East India Company killed them all. So when we talk about civilization and we talk about industry and we talk about development, then we also need to take, you know, both sides or multiple sides of those stories. And also, so to, to get back to your question about how do we deal? So all the, the images that I showed in my presentation, I'm either directly working on initiatives that address 
that marginalization, that invisibility, those contestations with projects that I have initiated or I've been running in the last 10 uh, to 11 years through my agency, The City, or I'm working with partners, like say the District 6 Museum, we work very closely on addressing the issues that their spatial isolation and uh, marginalization. But with that, you know, as I said earlier in my presentation, and with that spatial marginalization comes the lack of e economic opportunity and with that cultural representation. So often I get asked with the work that we do, oh, but you know, why are you making such a big fuss about representation, contested histories, memories and people's stories? It's all this like soft stuff. But what about like people just need homes and food? And I mean, no single person on this planet is just about the practical ways of living. We are practical, of course, if you want to go into marketing terms and business terms, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We do need our shelter, uh, society, people to care for, people to care for us. But also, we, our homes are not only places of shelter, they are places to invite people in to create memories. Um, and, and also I get, I, I often get told about, um, well, you know, you'll remember, like, I think uh, Holland is dealing a lot with this, with repatriation of human remains and uh, objects from museums. Uh, I remember Anissa, when we met at the Rijksmuseum, we were discussing this about objects taken. And I learned a lot about uh, a significant uh, sculpture that was there that was taken from Indonesia. And often European museum directors would say, oh, but um, you know, these countries don't know how to take care of it. We have the museums and the museum structures to take care of this. Well, hello, these were created in those countries and they know how to take care of it. If they created it, they know how to take care of these objects. I digress. Back to creating and addressing this uh, uh, marginalization. So what I've done, I, I can't speak for many institutions. I feel like our government is not doing enough. I mean, this is why an agency like mine can come to be, just because uh, the South African government, all of them, all the agencies are not doing enough um, to, to, to learn this history. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, when I was doing the movement Cape Town book, for citizens of the Cape to tell me that they felt underrepresented and unacknowledged is a shame in a democracy. During apartheid is one thing, but during in a democracy, I feel like if there was an intention by our government stated early that this is how we're going to address that marginalization and contestations, and you can, the public, you as the public can be part of this in these ways, then I don't think the amount of uh, protests that we see today um, would be happening. So in my agency, I have uh, two very big projects that I'm working on. One is called C, English, uh, which is visibility and acknowledgement. C here in Afrikaans, which is the Dutch Creole language of, uh, of South Africa. Um, we are focusing on history, memory, and making place. We are working transnationally. I'm working with Holland at the moment and hoping to work with Indonesia, hence Anissa and I, I knowing each other. Uh, and we wish to bring, uh, you know, by working transnationally, we start to bring stories out of the archives into the public domain. So we're working with archaeologists, architects, designers, uh, and diplomats, and various national archives to, to, to work on this uh, initiative. Everything is on our website, icu.capetown. I created this project website, especially for C. And then of course, I was talking about Park Station, which is a sub-Saharan Africa's primary transport node, or not, excuse me, not primary, but most one of its most significant tra um, uh, transport nodes with 1 million people moving through it one, every weekday. And of course, um, as many people would know, a lot of people from different parts of the continent moved to Johannesburg to find a better life. And so this has a wonderful opportunity, not only to be a welcoming space to, um, you know, to uh, a warm and welcoming space for African nationals, uh, and look, obviously local people, but it has an opportunity to re-script that colonial space, which was made to divide people to come into a place of inclusivity and welcome. Um, and so that project also we're working transnationally. I feel like all our work in South Africa has to be transnational, largely because we have histories with many cities and countries in the world. And so this is uh, my solutions uh, for the places and why I've chosen Park Station at, uh, of course, because of its history, uh, is as, is almost as old as Johannesburg. 
um, and also because of so many people moving through the space. And I honestly believe, I think many people would have heard about people being, uh, that South African people, nationals are attacking other African nationals so brutally in, in various spaces in South Africa. And I think that having a project like this, where all African people are so welcomed equally and not an us and them scenario being created, that is an opportunity for, for, for sharing. And I, don't, I believe that um, we won't have the violence that we see against African nationals um, if, if this was the case, if we had this space that was operational and functioning as a warm, um, not only as a train, in addition to a train station that is safe for people, but also a cultural center, marketing, well, sorry, markets, performance. So it has a day and night life, like many train stations. So during the day you have a market and at night you have a performing, um, a performance space and an exhibition space for all people that are moving through and living in Johannesburg. That's my solution. As I said, I can't speak for our government because they're shocking, uh, but I can speak for what my agency is doing. All right. Thank you very much, Sahira, for this extra, uh, for this very extra Im uh, information on the on your work and also on on, on the site, uh, the park station site. Kosha, um, do you have some uh, responses for Anissa's uh, question? Um, well, I think. Uh, and this, I was wondering whether, like, how do you grasp the fact that I said we advise? Uh, well, it's actually as broad as, as I, uh, as, I <laughs> as I wrote it, because um, we 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 are simply a, a a bridge between that what what is discussed within the international context and and also that was what is uh, happening in the Netherlands events uh, happenings discussions etc. And I, we, what we do is we try to simply. Um, uh, stimulate exchange and then with regards to this topic is for us for example we see that there is this discussion in the Netherlands of already for many years about how we deal with our own colonial past um, and then at the same time we see other countries in which this, this, these discussions are already um, uh, happening for for much longer um, so what we did we actually try to bring examples from uh, South Africa, from uh, the um, United States, from the Caribbean, from uh, other parts, even Turkey, to, uh, to the Netherlands, and to actually understand how in the Netherlands we can also develop strategies on dealing with our own contested histories. And the reason why we're mentioning it, that um, uh, especially on the policy level, um, it, for, for, for quite some time, there was a very ad hoc response. So a couple of years when there was already a discussion about the uh, J.P. Kuhn statue in, uh, in Horn, um, it, it almost uh, happened as if that was a new, a new uh, event, uh, even though these discussions about uh, statues in public space in relation to prominent figures, um, but that have a very, very dark history, but that hasn't been told, I think, in all its uh, forms. That has been happening in the Netherlands as well, but on a policy level, it tends to be, especially on municipal level, still difficult to, uh, to, to refer that or to translate it into policies. So what we tried is actually to also think with municipalities, so how can you develop strategies to avoid conflicts rather than uh, to respond to them? Um, so that's that's what I what I said with advice. Right, thank you. And while we're uh, with you, uh, Gosha, do you have any short, please keep it short, <laughs> reflections or questions for uh, any of the other two speakers? Uh, well, with regard to the story of Zahira, I was really happy to see the example because I think this exactly illustrates why we need organizations like yours uh, to actually. Uh, put into practice what uh, perhaps UNESCO tends to say in words. And I think that's the biggest difference is that at the end of the day, you know, heritage is preserved almost always by people that are locally involved in the most difficult con uh, context. Um, and I think that can only be uh, um, applauded. Um, and I think it's really good that you chose a very, very, um, not only practical place, but a place which is, is uh, is, is uh, referring to equality. And I think the biggest issue is always equality uh, because generally there's always a dominant part towards a certain narrative and then it's really difficult to have a certain dialogue. Um, then coming to the point of Anissa, um, I was really wondering 
Um, so you, you, you said fake news had already happened uh, in the 18th century. Um, so how are the British institutions now describing these events? Uh, did I answer now? Yes, you can answer now. It's okay. Thank you, Koisha. <laughs> Thank you, Koisha. Um, so, well, actually, uh, when they, they had the treaty in 1820, so that's kind of like the thing that ends everything. Um, they, uh, a year, a year later, they, uh, reprint the map with the writing, um, pirate codes and pirate port, but then the treaties come into effect, they change it. So they actually track, retract the map and change it into Trucial Coast. So the, the Trucial Coast consists of, from like the north from Kuwait up to up to uh, up to the up to Rasa Khaimah. So um, so they didn't really go on with this fake news after they got what they want, which is the ultimate right to protect the region, and that actually continues up to the the sixties when the um, when the oil comes. Okay, so the British didn't really like we own this, but we can help you protect on the process and how to get oil, blah, 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 blah. So, um, so uh, they didn't, uh, after they got what they want, this kind of big shadow until now, um, even in, in terms of culture, I don't know if there's anyone here. <laughs> when I started working here in the UAE, then I see why there are so many um, British Museum people in developing the new museums, even in the national museum, it's all very British. Uh, even the, the database system that they're using is the same 90s looking database system that's been using British Museum. So um, in a way, I think that what they're doing now, they're not using the fake news anymore, but I don't think they're really going to go away from the region anytime soon. More subtle, you know. Yeah, cultural diplomacy, uh -huh. in a way, yeah. Um, even kijk hoor, the, I see there is a whole bunch of uh, quite interesting questions already in the, in the, uh, in the chats. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, Thijs, would you, uh, uh, Zahira, is it okay if we go to questions? Because I also see there's a bunch of interesting questions addressed to you. Okay. I don't hear you, but <laughs> I think you said yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. We, we will wait. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Go, Thais. You can uh, read up some of the questions if you want. So what I'll do is um, I selected the questions for Anissa, Kosh, and Sahira separately. And maybe it's nice to uh, start with a couple questions that were sent early on to Anissa. For example, Jan Franz, he asked, um, do you know any buildings that are uh, seen as contested in uh, the Emirates? Buildings or spaces? Building or spaces. Well, um, I must say when we're talking about contested history in this region, it's a bit, it's a bit different in a way that since we're always talking about there was a colon colonial power kind of like violence and then take over and then kind of change the topography of the land and all these things it didn't really happen here so all these buildings the force that they made they built they built themselves so they're U european destroyed and then they build it and then there's um uh, the portuguese built a few forts on they just change, they just use it as a museum and never really kind of having a problem with it in a way. Kind of, okay, yeah, people die at the time. Okay, but now, you know, we have, we want to develop the tourism. So it, it, it doesn't really, uh, it's not really as complicated as, like I said, Sawalunto in Indonesia. You know, it, it's a very clear black and white. The Dutch came, okay. built it, and then they left it behind. Yeah. That, that too is an is a, is a answer, yeah. Okay, well, wow. thank you. Great. Um, Carol uh, Pro, she uh, wrote, how does um, the Emirates refer to the 
pirate coast, which is uh, often used in uh, Western Europe. Uh, what is mm. the correct name? Well, for now, it is like, um, it is depends on which emirate are you in. So there's the there's the Sarja coast, there is the Asahaima coast, there's the Dubai coast. So there is no more of that name um, on on the map anymore. But um, honestly, informally, uh, people who came here, especially people from the other Arab countries, they still believe that the current uh, ruler, the Sheikhdom, are descendants of the pirates. So they still believe it. So they. They, they're not people from like the history or whatever, like the general population of the Arab speaking countries who came here to work, they do believe that this was the country of the pirates. All right. And uh, Jenna also asked you a question. Um, and she was um, uh, referring to the similarities uh, that you mentioned between uh, the uh, Emirates and Indonesia. And, um, and she asked, what can the Netherlands government learn uh, from, from these two countries? Well, you know, there's a, there's a difference between something that you can learn and something that you can do. I mean, um, all this kind of conversation is, you know, it's our way of trying to look for best, fact, best uh, practice and what people were doing before. And let's say from this um, kind of these two studies that this, uh, uh, Davies uh, did from the British side and uh, the Sheikh of Sarja did it and they're doing it around the same time, 97 to 98, then they work based on the same documentation, which eventually the doc, it was 20,000 sheet of paper, I guess, or more, um, that was eventually um, uh, being donated to the Arab Study Center in the Exeter University, where Davis was, uh, was based. So in this kind of way, it looks like kind of like a collaborative research, which I'm sure it's already been done by the, uh, by, between the Dutch and the Netherlands. But of course, I haven't really uh, maybe I need to read more, but I haven't really seen the, the similar magnitude of kind of defying or kind of, you know, clarifying of, of, of what, what, what happened. For instance, um, Kusha was talking about uh, Yepikun, right? This is always a repeated, you know, conversation, like why you have the, the statue of, of the, a, mass, um, a mass murderer, well, in Indonesia, we, we, we put down the, uh, we, we, we took down the, the statue and we didn't really talk about it, which I think is not actually a good way to not talk about it. And um, uh, in recent years, uh, there was a focus on Banda because Banda, this one island, I see it, it's an important space. It's an, in, it, it's, that was the, the location of the starting point of where Indonesia and Netherlands actually met. Like that's where our relationship actually started. It's a bloody one, yes, of course, but it's there. Okay, so Batavia got the, Batavia was built because of the influx of the income from the sales of the nutmeg, the nutmeg uh, domination came from killing the people in the Banda Island. But then, you know, the celebration of Banda, the, what, which year was that? 400, 400 years of the Breda, I think. It was a, it was a Breda Treaty that actually um, makes the, the, so Breda Treaty, if you haven't heard of it, it's a treaty that was, that was done in Breda by the French to kind of make peace between the Dutch and the British. Mm, in that treaty, the main thing is that the Dutch will take Banda while the British will take Manhattan of New York. Okay, so mm -hmm. the first thing that was celebrated in Indonesia was this city. Not about, you know, all these thousand people that were killed that led to the, that led to the treaty. So there's something wrong. I, I don't know if it's wrong because it's from my side of the country. 
but the initiative is from my side of fence. Like I don't understand why um, the number of people who died was not was not more important than the fact that we almost had Manhattan. Manhattan, there's a possibility Manhattan was going to be part of our country. Like it's a BS kind of. Sorry, I'm trying to be polite. So. No, it's, um, it's all right. Then, but this this jumps into the uh, the history perspective, and I, I exactly. think the question of Jinnah uh, was more of a, um, a future government uh, perspective, in which uh, yeah, it sorry. should be much more uh, uh, well well placed and and considerate to uh, to everybody. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm. Uh, it, it's a little bit emotional in a way. I was in between this kind of situation. So when you're trying to make a policy, you want to give a suggestion. Okay, how we can deal with this? There's a best practice here, but I. It's not clear what is understand by Indonesia. Uh, what is the meaning of decolonization? What is the meaning of um, colonialism in the country? what is the most the more important story for our country in comparison to what is important for for the netherlands side this is this is the things that it's basic so if we want to kind of follow up with the best practice maybe we can start on asking of why there is no proper discussion of colonialism in indonesian museums in indonesian um, 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 education system. So I'm I'm not I'm not going to kind of blame the the Netherlands side or whatever. I I I trust there was already an effort, a lot of effort. The first museum education done in 1965 was by Renwood Academy. There was no museum education done before. So there's already an effort. But you know it, it's it's difficult for me to to give. But um, thank you, Gina, for asking this. This is actually a difficult uh, question that Remco already tried to, to, to ask me before. What I can hope that both countries can kind of learn from this, if we can kind of uh, put us on the kind of the same understanding and definition of what is colonialism, what is decolonialism, what is shared heritage? Do we really want to share our heritage with you? Where where is the, that where is where is that term coming from? You know, because the the event between 1945 to 1949, we are seeing it in two different sides, two two different sides. This um, from our side, we see it, we are taking back our independence, but from your side, the words are using we are you are transferring the sovereignty. So there is this, you know, we, we should meet in the middle of, you know, un, under, understanding, you know, the same, uh, understanding the same definition. First. Then we can kind of work on what we can do in the same level. Sorry, to kind of. A bit no, thank you, thank you. I, I think it's very good that you uh, are able to express yourself to to a group uh, of whom many you do not know, so that that takes a lot of effort. So it's very good that you took your time to to make, make a stand for it. Um, Thank you. If you're up, okay with it, we will uh, ask the questions to Kausha now. Um, Kausha, uh, already in the chat, you uh, defined the definition of netcom uh, for Nicholas and um, um, Jay van Donkersvoet uh, wrote uh, that it would be uh, not only positive messages from UNESCO that he would want to uh, reflect on. Um, and Jan Frans wanted to know where the, down, the book could be downloaded, which you also addressed to already. And Peter Fundi, he um, wrote the difference between contested history and dissonant history that's something that he uh, asked if you could explain or expand on that okay um well i will come back to two points one is the positive message 
Um, I, um, I think what is important, I already shared the link to the ICOMOS position paper. Actually, it was the recommendation, or at least these were some statements made by ICOMOS experts, um, that the World Heritage List um, uh, uh, did not, or at least the World Heritage Convention with its peace principles, in a sense, uh, did, did not, or at least that con uh, sites Link, linked to or associated to recent conflicts uh, somehow do not really fit well with this peace message. Um, interestingly enough, uh, what is recent conflict? In this case, they took a hundred years. So that's, I'm, I'm not sure how recent is hundred years ago, but that fits pretty much a lot of conflict. Um, and I myself, but that's on a personal note, do not agree with the the uh, the statement that the World Heritage Convention and the World Heritage List should um, uh, have has a positive uh, um, uh, mandate or a, it has a peace mandate, but it doesn't always have to be positive. I'm a, a strong um, advocate to actually have also sites on it uh, on the list that actually have uh, force us to reflect on certain events um, and. The only problem is, is UNESCO is a political organization, so you always have two sides towards a certain event. So that's very difficult to keep politics out of the discussion. Um, so the second one was the question dissonant versus contested. Well, actually, I think that's also to a certain extent an academic discussion. Um, I think dissonant um, has the implication that the that the visitors or the people that view the heritage actually has a have a distance to the to uh, to, to the events that have happened, that they have difficulties understanding why certain uh, events have happened. Um, and contested, I think, implies that there are groups that just have different viewpoints, but that, that actually identify with this, with a certain part of this, this, uh, uh, this narrative. Um, I, I think it's you know, to, to a certain extent, if you look at Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, there are still people that have direct links to the survivors of Auschwitz-Birkenau. I think that it's very contemporary, even though the events may have happened 75 years ago. I don't think it's very dissonant. I think it's actually something that is still very much uh, present and also to that extent contested. But that's just my uh, humble uh, viewpoint. I think the academics have different <laughs> ideas about it. So I give it back to the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's uh, it's good to to share your uh, point of view because that's why we asked you as a speaker, and um, and it's it's wonderful that you can make such a clear comparison for it. Um, as a remainder, uh, because uh, we only have a couple of minutes uh, left uh, for us tonight in in um, local time. Uh, Saira, um, many uh, uh, questions have already been addressed, uh, but many came in also. Um, uh, Jinna uh, also asked you a question, wondering uh, for the train station, what would be the uh, key elements for success for this public space? Um, firstly, I think the understanding from people that it is public. Um, I think there's still a very incredible and sad mindset in South Africa that public space is not public. Um, so in the past, uh, three or four black people congregated together, just having a chat could be arrested uh, because that wasn't allowed during apartheid. So although almost three decades have passed, it's still very entrenched in South African society. So I think what gets people to understand that space is public is to have events and programming. I think that is, and, and obviously, I think the old photographs um, you would have seen that I showed of Johannesburg's Park Station were beautiful. We spoke about the architecture, it's magnificent. It was very considered. There were specific, and South Africa's most famous architects at the time were brought together, Leith and Mordike. Um, and so I, um, so my proposal to the, for, for, to the city of Johannesburg, at that time, the mayor of Johannesburg, Parks Tau, was for us to use architecture, design and art to make a beautiful space, 
but also to welcome programming. So my, so yeah, so my opinion is exactly what the, the work and the proposal that I made to the city of Johannesburg is firstly to open up that vaulted space that was made, um, that was degrading to black people, uh, but that is a sense of nostalgia for white people is to re-script that space completely and um, make that space a warm, welcoming uh, space for Black African people, uh, largely because they mainly use the space, and not only as a train station. I mean, when I started working on Park Station all those years ago, there were five public benches. Can you imagine five public benches outside for possibly one million people every weekday? So that is clearly that the Passenger Rail Association in the city of Johannesburg is saying, we don't want you to linger and stay. We want you to move. Whereas what you saw of the old station, please linger. In fact, one of the best restaurants in South Africa was in that train station, the Blue Room. So it, what it said was that for white people, please use this station, linger, show your culture, show your identity, show your architecture, but black people, please don't. We don't wanna see it move, shift along. And in fact, you're only here for labor. So the sensibility of apartheid South Africa has not changed into our democracy. So we wanted to create an inclusive, welcoming space. And why I mentioned earlier a day and night life, Johannesburg moves all the time. And some people come to shop in Johannesburg just for, you know, they come for 72 hours, 24 hours sometimes from other parts of Southern, um, Southern Africa. So what a wonderful opportunity to create a market space, a performance space, culture, music, 24 hours. And so people work in shifts. And I had been working also with Wits University to possibly um, house the Wits cent uh, um, Center for Economic, um, yes, it's uh, the Wits, Wits Institute, Institute for uh, Social and Economic Research, WISER. We wanted to take one of the floors of that station. So what work they do and their research they do is exactly understanding the Afropolitan city. And so what a wonderful place to see that um, engage, in engaging with that every day. And so that is my proposal. I still hold very close to that proposal because I feel knowing South Africa's you know, uh, violent um, contemporary situation of how we are behaving with other African nationals, um, it's deplorable actually, and, and, and it's embarrassing and very hurtful for, for people. Um, and I feel like when you break bread together, gluten-free bread, <laughs> uh, <laughs> when you come together, break bread, share music, you will never pull a gun or knife to that person after you know them. And so that is the pure, very simple logic of mine for creating, uh, or not creating, but re-scripting that space. Thank you. I think this also answers uh, to the question that uh, Rosalie uh, sent in the chat. Uh, this would be the way to decolonize the space as well. And um, I think um, I think our time is uh, is is up. Uh, Remco, I, th I yes. give the word to you. All right, thank you, Thais, and thank you, uh, dear speakers, for uh, addressing the questions from the audience. Thank you, audience, for asking the questions. I do hope that it was a satisfactory uh, uh, evening in that sense uh, also. Um, I would like to now close today's session because it's uh, now nine uh, of uh, 30, uh, half past, uh, so half past nine <laughs> in the Netherlands. Uh, it's actually almost midnight for Anissa already. So I think it's time to call it a day. Um, so please, first, I would like to very much uh, thank you, Anissa, uh, Koosje, Zahira, and of course also Kathleen, uh, by you know the message that Kathleen sent in for your uh, contribution for today's uh, discussion. I think we did not have enough time to discuss all the different elements of your the, the, the topics and the, the, the examples that you addressed, but I do hope that you at least have the feeling that uh, to use, to come back to uh, Koshia's uh, talk, that at least the dialogue has started and I hope the dialogue will continue uh, also after this evening. Um, then I have some yeah, Zahira, hi. No, no, I just see some people asking for contact details. Oh, yes. Or, or, yeah, so could we share that very quickly? Yeah, please. Because you know, I'm wondering, yeah, if you close the chat, then I'm wondering if that would go on. So our website uh, for my agency is the cityagency.co.za. 
The C Project website is icu.capetown. And we are on Instagram, the city agency, and I see you underscore CPT, as well as Facebook, the city agency. So all the information of the work we're doing is, is there. So. Good. Thank you very much, Sahira. Um, then I would like to, uh, on behalf of the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands, I would like to offer you, um, three of you, a nice present. And I can, will share my screen now so you know what the present is. The only thing you have to do is after this meeting or tomorrow, send me your address, your home address or whatever address you want to receive this gift on. <laughs> and I hope you can see this. Uh, it's the new edition of the Reuse, Redevelop and Design um, a publication by the Cultural Heritage Agency, which was already published earlier, but this is a new version because it has some additional case studies. So uh, as a thank you for tonight, we will send this to you uh, um, by postal uh, mail. Um, then uh, the second thing I want to address is um, there is actually at the moment also the Cultural Heritage Agency and the Rijnwort Academy here in Amsterdam are hosting a two week workshop on uh, sharing uh, stories on contested histories. And the final presentations of the, 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 the participants of this, of this training, which are actually from all the different partner countries of the Netherlands, including South Africa, including Indonesia, uh, and, and a bunch of other countries, is on the 23rd of April. And it's via Zoom, so you can register and maybe Jinnah can share the link in the chat so people can actually go there and register for these final presentations. So it's very much related to our topic of tonight. And then the very last um, um, practical message to you is you're all invited, of course, for next week's, uh, next month's, sorry, next month's uh, lectures evening, which will be on Wednesday, the 12th of May. And it will be on um, botanical gardens with relation to scientific like the scientifics behind the science, I mean, behind uh, bot botany and of course the colonial context of botanical gardens. So I do hope you will also be able to join us next month. All right, that was it for tonight. Thank you very much all and have a pleasant remainder of your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.